Hello, everybody. It's Keith. Help support the Northeast scene and declare yourself a member today. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or your podcast medium of choice. Rate us and leave a review. Every little bit helps. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It has every podcast episode plus other exclusive content. Like and leave a comment. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the NE Scene. Also, continue to write us at northeastscene at gmail.com. We want to share your experiences as well. And now, here's the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Northeast Scene Podcast. This is Keith. And Tommy. And you know what time it is. Podcast time. It's Monday night. <laughs> it's Monday night. This is it. I, you know, I felt, I felt like anxious and weird before we started, but now that we're in it, I feel better. Really? Isn't that, yeah. Dude, I, I, get, I get anxious before everything. Like I told... I was talking to Romy last night, and I was explaining anxiety, and she's like, oh, you should be on medication, maybe. And I was like, no, 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 like, everything makes me anxious. The only way, like, everything, that's just normal. The only way I'm going to go on medication is if I start having panic attacks panic, in public. Yeah. yeah. That, that's what it's going to take. Yeah, I, I've never, I mean, I've gotten panicky before, but it's always, like, something that's... um it's always associated with something else. Like I can, I usually hear when people talk about like real serious panic issues, they mm-hmm. just get panic for no reason. Like it just comes out of nowhere and yeah. it just hits them like a ton of bricks. I get nervous about things, but I don't get like, it's, it's usually it's associated with something. So like I have a big, big presentation at work tomorrow and I have to present in front of like 40 people. Like that's like, a, okay. Okay. I, I get a little, like, you know, antsy about stuff like that. But everything else, like... If right. I-, I just get nervous. If I think you should be medicated when you can't do what you have to do. Yeah. I can I can get everything done, but I'm just nervous. That's it. It's just... Uh, if I feel like there's uh, sometimes where I, I, I've seen people that have that... Um, it's like a regulation issue. Like, they can't keep it in the middle... Like yes. their, their needle is always in the red. Like it's always crazy. It's like, no, yo, nothing. It, it's either like they're like super manic or they have nothing. It's like, you need to get somewhere in the center because <laughs> this is very hard to deal with you. <laughs> well, it's Monday night and it's podcast time, our favorite time. So tonight we're going to be talking to none other than Romina Herrera Malatesta, world renowned fashion stylist and my girlfriend. And Chuck Moran, who is famous for doing the graphics for the Northeast scene. Oh, and also a little thing called Horror Prince, where he does uh, shirts and models. Yeah, he did stuff for like, I don't know, like the Cranberries and Patton Oswalt and the Melvins and stuff like that. So, I mean, Maserati. His his big deal is Northeast scene, though. (laughs) (laughs) That's like his, when people get, that's his calling card at this point. They will be joining us and we'll be talking to them. And, oh, Tommy, I wanted to ask you, you said you set a date for quitting vaping? Yeah, dude. When? Uh, I want to quit on Saturday, so I actually have one more tat, one of those. So I use uh, uh, Views. Mm -hmm. I stopped using Juul. It got too expensive. So I have one Views cartridge, and I kind of plan on it. it, It'll most likely be done Friday night or Saturday morning. So uh, not Saturday morning. I don't really see I don't vape in the mornings. Um, I, I really only do it at night when I get, uh, like, you know, after dinner, that kind of thing. Views used to be my brand and I started vaping again around this time last year. I've since stopped, but I, I, I got on the jewel tip cause I was going out more and my friends were doing it and it started with me taking a puff here and there. And of course it escalated to me sitting at this very desk and being like, should I buy it? Should I buy it? Should I buy it? Yeah, I'm going to buy it. And then I went to the bodega and bought it and, you know, smoked it and felt pretty good. And it was <laughs> like everything else. It was fun at first. And then it became 
it's a chore. At that. Yeah, it, 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 I started doing it all the time, and it started making me more anxious than feeling good. And then I was doing it in like bathrooms and oh. at work and on the way to work. And I don't, I don't smoke it like a normal person. Tommy, you know this because we were at that All Fell show yeah. around this time last year, and I, I, I figured out if you take the cartridge out and put it back in, <laughs> you get like a a big hit, like it's the first new cartridge. So I would do that every single time I took a hit. I remember you and I were tell we were texting one night, and <laughs> I was talking about uh, how you know I smoke a little bit before I go to bed, and I was like, yeah, I have it in bed with me, but. Um, <laughs> You were like, yeah, I had to stop doing that. I literally would do it at night until I got dizzy and then fall asleep. <laughs> You're like, it's everything else I do in my life. I can't do it a little bit. I have to fucking take it to the extreme. And I was like, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I, t- I, I would sleep with it in bed next to me. And oh. I, would, I, would, I would smoke it until I got dizzy and then went to go to sleep. And I would wake up and take a hit. I would take hits in the morning. Um, and then I'm going to the deli every other day to buy slap down $40 and buy another pack of uh, mango cartridges. Oh, shit, still... is that a, that's how much they are? 40 bucks up in, in New York? Yeah, close to. And I was like, I was like, I'm doing this. I'm spending money I don't have. I'm miserable. <laughs> this is, this is just drugs all over it, again. It, 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 yeah. In a much smaller, in a much smaller, more manageable form. It, it's yeah. a, the exact same idea though. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't keep mine with me during the day, uh, mainly because I mean I'm on camera for a good chunk of the day anyway, teaching. So it's like I, I don't want it with me because that yes. temptation to use it and then like walk in front of the camera and be like, Ooh, like a big cloud of smoke come out and me be like, <laughs> anyway, when we're solving systems of equations, like that kind of shit. Like uh, I just keep it upstairs in a drawer, and so when I'm done work, I'll have a little bit. When I'm done dinner, I have a little bit, and then I have a little bit before I go to bed. Like I usually, so before I go to bed, I I usually work out real quick and then shower and then um, hit it a couple times and then put it back in the drawer. I'm an expert at quitting things now, so I was. It got to the point where I knew I had to stop. And around New Year's Eve, I was like, "All right, New Year, that's it. I'm done." And I stopped, and I was at Romy's house, and. I felt a physical withdrawal because I was smoking, I don't know, one of those five milligram cartridges a day, I think. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. I, and I, I don't know, I, I was, our relationship was newer, so I didn't feel comfortable not being home anyway. So I was like, I, I got to go home. I'm sorry. Like, I, I felt crazy. Oh, uh, yeah. So hey. there was like a day or two of that. And then thankfully I stopped. That's like, completely stopped. Yeah, I think this is going to be an easier transition for me in terms of like uh, for me quitting smoking really sucked. Um, it was just one of those things I just, I, you know, I have kids and I want to stay healthy, like not like vaping is much healthier for you. Um, but uh, I quit smoking for about oh, like over, I don't know, three, four months. Yeah. Uh, and then I would go like I would do these things where I would, you know, go out and I would go out with I mean, mainly you. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I would go and be like, well, I'm going out with Keith. Like we're going to this is hardcore. Let's I'm going to buy a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. Um, But it, it's like that's what it was is like I would smoke for that day and then throw them in the trash. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's it's not fun. I've reached a point where I won't even touch them anymore, even on special occasions, because I just know. It's not fun. It's not going to change anything. It no. it's just it's just an an attempt to take myself out of myself, and it serves no purpose at all. So that's it. It's over. It's a fen- it's over, Johnny. It's that- <laughs> <laughs> it's a phenomenal attitude to have about it because it really is like it it. There's no added value. Like I no. don't. Um, other than for me, like the relaxation part of it, um, and the it's that routine part of it is huge now. Um, but yeah, I started again when we, when the, when we got quarantined. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, like the first, like two weeks of quarantine, we were just home and I was like kind of going up the walls and I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, I was only teaching an hour a day, (laughs) so I didn't really have much to do. My day was done at 10 30 in the morning. And, you know, as like with anything like idle hands, 
it just immediately I went to let's replace normal life with something else. So, <laughs> um, yeah, just on a whim, I got a thing in the mail um, because I was a smoker for a long time. I used to get the offers from like Marlboro and Camel and stuff like that. Um, nine times out of 10, it's for garbage stuff that I won't use like camel, like chewing tobacco, like that snus stuff. I'm like, I'm not using that. Um, but did you ever do that? Uh, did I ever chew tobacco? Yeah. In college, in college I did for, I knew you were going to say in college, I could just see you up in Wilkes bar with the fucking spittle bottle and like, Uh, Oh, that's a big thing with, uh, lacrosse football wrestling. That was like, uh, that was like the common thread. All of us at parties, you would have a beer in one hand and then a spitter in the other. So I saw some people posting online. You know that party in Philly making time? Yeah, I never went to that. I, I mean, was going to ask if you've ever been to one. No, I remember I went to that. It is. I went to that other place, the 700 Club. Yes. But I, I never went to making time. I've been to it a bunch of times. I've seen all these electronic indie acts that people talk about, LCD sound system, soul wax, whoever else. I don't remember any of it. Oh yeah. I I don't remember who is who. (laughs) And it's, it's not my go-to genre of music. I don't listen to DJs or that type of stuff really. So I, I wasn't paying attention and I was also never sober there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I was reminded of another funny story. You're going to like this. Before I moved to New York, I think it was 2011 or 12. And a friend of mine is like, hey, you know, my boyfriend is part of making time. He needs someone to work there for the night to help bands load in and all this stuff. You know, they'll pay you $100. And I was like, sure, I'll go. Now... Sending me to a bar to go work is like is like asking Cookie Monster to to reshelf the cookies in the grocery store. Oh, you know, no. it, yeah, yeah. It, it's so Fox in the Hen House. Yeah, this is what a disaster I used to be. I I go there, and Pat and Stan Stan is in town. Oh, so, okay. So they came by, and I was like, "Hey, I'm gonna go leave with these guys for a minute." Just call me when things are getting started, and I'll come back. Now, that alone is a horrible thing to do at a job. Like, hey, I'm going to leave the job. You call me when it's time to come back, and then I'll come back. Yeah. So I go to the bar with them, and I have a bunch of drinks. And then I come back after they call me. I'm surprised they even called me. (laughs) And I come back, and I just... I'm sort of working, I guess, but like... I'm just drinking like I'm at making time, you know? And I, I, I got into, I, I'm guessing I got pretty drunk pretty early. And then, of <laughs> course, since I'm drunk, I'm like, well, I need something else. So I just leave. I just leave and I go down to Old City to meet up with a friend and grab something and, and come back. And then, you know, I'm, and <laughs> I'm doing my job. Like, I'm helping the bands load in and keeping an eye on everything. And But... At one point, the guy calls me and he's like, he's like, are you drunk? Like someone said you're drunk or you're at the bar. And I was like, what? What? Like I, I had a drink, but no, I'm, I'm fine. Everything's fine. And, you know, it, it was like, I was like backstage partying with one of the bands and then I loaded them out and I, I wanted to leave to go pick up something else, oh. if you know what I'm saying. But yeah. you have to get down there at a certain time. Oh, yeah, or else, or else that street's closed. Yeah, yeah. So I call, and I'm like, hey, everything's loaded out. Work's all done. So uh, I'm going to get going. And I, I left. And I, uh, you know, props to the to the guy. They still paid me. Jesus. Yeah, they they paid me. It was like all fives and ones, though. So I think that was kind of like the fuck you, uh, which which warranted, certainly warranted. Yeah. But I saw I saw that dude again, and I was like, hey man, I'm sorry about all that. You know, like how that panned out. Well, that was cool of you. I mean, that's the thing is, is like we do shitty stuff, but as long as you make amends eventually, and you know, recognize that you were in the wrong with shit. Like I don't, I don't yeah. see an issue with that. Like I, I mean, I've made like. <sighs> 
I don't think I've told this story, but I, I got fired from a job that I had that was like a family friend hired me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it was just like a short time job. He was building a car wash and he just needed laborers, people to move things, set things up. Like I didn't, I, I, you know, I think I was 16 at the time. And, uh, I remember, (laughs) uh, I showed up to work and it was, uh, he had multiple car wash locations. So I'd have to drive in between some of them. So sometimes he would say, Hey, go to this one and do X, Y, and Z, and then go to this one and do this one. And then Mm -hmm. like, um, he had a pay. This is how long ago this was. He didn't have a cell phone. He had a pager. So when I would get to each location, I would page him. Um, so he paged me and said, Hey, call me. So I called him and I said, you know, where do you need me to be? He goes, we have the one in Warminster, go to the one in Warminster. I'm getting a lot of complaints. The coin machines are jammed. I'm like, okay, well, right in front of the, the pizza place is this other, or in front of the, uh, car wash is a pizza place called Reese's pizzas. And I was like, cool. I'm going to go whoa, in. Whoa, 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 whoa. The yeah. pizza place is called Reese's pizzas. Yeah. That is really stupid. It's clever though. It's been in business for a long ass time. So whatever. I go to get a slice there. And I get a. Do slice. they put Reese's pieces on the pizza? No, it's regular pizza. I think the okay. dude's name is actually Reese, though, for real. I'm not oh. sure, but I go to get a pizza and a soda, and I'm sitting in the parking lot, and um, it wasn't like you know, Warminster's like a it's a suburban neighborhood, so yeah. uh, I heard like tire screech, and then like you know, like that kind of thing. I was like, holy shit, someone's coming in here in a hurry. So. Um, I was literally sitting in the, like, it was like a middle booth kind of thing that you could make change from. So, uh, I was sitting there eating my pizza. (laughs) The guy who owns the place is like, I've been trying to call you for like half an hour. I'm like, oh, I took a break, but I just, and I'm literally, you know, I have pizza in my mouth as I'm trying to explain this to him. Yeah. He's like, you're fucking fired. And I was like, but I didn't do anything wrong. I, like, I just, I, I just got here. I went to go get a piece of pizza. I, like the coin machine's unjammed. He's like, how am I supposed to know that? You never called me. I'm like, okay, well, you can go and check. It's unjammed. Like, keep in mind, I'm 16. Um, 16? So, yeah. I, I, I was a little kid. You know, I was a kid. Um, so there was. A, you're telling me there was only a 30-minute lapse in time, and he freaked out that much? Well, he also lived only about t- – he lived in, like, um, Southampton, so he was only, like, 10 minutes away. So I guess he couldn't get in touch with me and was like, hey, the kid never showed up to the spot, and now it was a Saturday. So people are trying to, like – there's literally a line for people to wash their cars. Um, and he's like, I'm losing money by the minute because this kid's not fucking calling me. And I, to this – like, up until, like, a few years ago, I was like, that dude's a dick. And then, <laughs> then afterwards, I was like, look, he just – asked me literally to walk inside and make a phone call and be like, Hey, I'm here and it's unjammed and you're fine. But instead of doing that, I went and got a pizza. I got a soda. I smoked a cigarette. I was like sitting there hanging out. And this guy's like, my livelihood is making sure this place is working and your asshole fucking self is sitting inside here. And I don't know what's happening. So he lost his temper and like, was like, you're fired. And I was like, Oh, okay, well I'll just going to go home. I mean, the job was done right there wasn't a backup at the car wash yeah but he had no idea like he why would he assume there was a backup at the car wash because so here's what happens is there's a in a there's an electronic signal that when the machine gets used um it tells that the machine is being properly like that it's it's properly doling out all the you know like so if you pay for the you know seven minute car because it was one of those self-serve ones where you just you you made change and then you put the quarters in and it would turn on for a certain amount of time well it was all computer controlled so like he knew when the when they were functioning correctly and when they weren't but the problem was in order to reset them somebody had to manually go in and unjam all the quarters and like you know uh reset it like so you physically had to be you couldn't do it from the computer so here he is at home like looking at it going like this shit ain't working and then I fixed it, but the problem is, is that I, I guess on his end, he never saw that. So he was waiting for the phone call rather than the actual look at the computer and see if the fucking thing's working. So he like lost his shit at me. And I was like, I don't know what to tell you, bro. Like, keep in mind, it was like a $5 an hour job. And it was just one of these things I did for like, I, I actually only worked there for whatever, three weeks. And then he fired me. And my mom was like, you're never going back there. Well, I think getting fired is a rite of passage. I got fired from my first job, and you learn, you know, eventually, 
Hopefully. I got fired from Super Fresh, too. Yeah? Yeah. Well, we're going to save that story for another time. Yeah. <laughs> That's a better story anyway, so. All right. We're going to talk to Romina now, and she's going to talk about her life, her work, and also what it's like to be in a relationship with me. Oh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of interesting content there. <laughs> <laughs> we could we we can share stories about dealing with Keith time. We could be that's like, a, that's exactly why I want to do this. It's going to be good for the show. Here we go. Now we're here with world renowned fashion stylist and my partner, Romina Herrera Malatesta. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Romy. Welcome to the show. Now, you're actually our first female guest to the show, which is great, because we need more women on the show. How does it feel? Um, no pressure, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no pressure at all. You're, you're representing all women, so no, no pressure. Okay, so I might be very careful about what I say. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Now, um, thank you. We were excited to have you on because Tommy wants to know what it's like to be in a relationship with me. Now, he's kind of in a relationship with me, too, so he knows, and you guys can talk about it, you know? Share war stories. Yeah, I, can I say this? I, is it Quadra Culado? <laughs> yes. I love that because it's so accurate. For those of you that don't know, it's uh, Romy's nickname for Keith. And it means graph paper because he is such he is such an ultra regimented person. He really likes things very specific. Um, and he's like super. Uh, what do you what do you call that? Like a type A personality, like where you like um, yeah. everything has to be in very like organized, orderly, painfully so. The schedule is really important. You can break the schedule. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, we got to keep to a schedule or we'll all die. That's the way it goes. <laughs> but, you know, I, I wanted to have you on the show, Romy, because, you know, we have such a powerful love that cannot be broken by anything, but also because we celebrated one year together this past weekend. Yes, that was amazing. Can you believe it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Neither can I, but we made it. But first, let's talk about you a little bit now. Oh, Tommy, go ahead and ask. Yeah, I actually asked this before it, and Keith was like, no, save it for when we're recording. And I was like, okay. So, Romy, where are you originally from? And Keith said you have a funny story that surrounds that, so. Well, I was born in Argentina, um, in Buenos Aires, but my mom is from Italy. Okay. And my dad is from Venezuela. Oh, and they were there. My mom moved there after the war in Italy. Um, it's a kind of a, a long story, but my grandfather and his wife and two kids left. You know, there was a huge recession after the world around 1945. I think yeah. they, moved, they moved to Argentina in 1947. Um, it was a post-war recession, depression, very uh, hard times in Italy. And my grandfather took his family and decided to go explore another part of the universe, basically. And he, he was inspired by a friend. And back then, you know, there wasn't like internet or electronic transactions or anything like that. So he divided his money in two and gave half his money to his friend, and he kept half just in case anything happened. And his friend stole the half that my grandfather gave him. So when they arrived, they, they were like in kind of a financial struggle, and they felt really betrayed, and they didn't really know anyone. So it was a kind of a hard uh, transition for them. And my mom, you know, uh, was raised into this very old school, extremely Catholic, very formal, high morals type um, environment. So she fell in love with a wild, artistic, bohemian Venezuelan. 
<laughs> Which so was is that it? where you get that from? Yes. And <laughs> the truth is my father was crazy and wild and an alcoholic. And he was also uh, mixed race. Like he was most of it like a Caribbean guy, like uh, a mix of like indigenous, black and, and Spanish. And so my grandfather was super racist and he hated it. So he didn't, you know, when my mom and my dad got married, uh, they didn't speak to her for a long, long time. And we lived there um, in, in Buenos Aires for like eight years. And finally, they moved to Venezuela where his family was. And so for me, it was really strange because, you know, I was already like, a mixed race kid in Buenos Aires. And then I moved to this new country where I had a very heavy accent. Hello, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I was foreign, you know. So I don't know. I, it, it was crazy because I kind of always been foreign. I don't feel fully Argentinian. I don't feel fully Venezuelan. Um, I don't feel Italian. But the truth is that I have the three passports. and. <laughs> I am those things. Yeah. So, and what I what I thought was funny, well one it just the way you tell it. You know, I I that I just like the way you tell the stories. So I guess things always seem kind of funny even if they aren't. That's one. <laughs> and two, you know, you 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 give yourself a hard time about your accent, but I don't have any trouble understanding you. Like even before I knew you. Well, oh, yeah. Not that's at all. amazing because I have a very thick accent and Sometimes when I'm nervous, like right now, <laughs> I it, I mix words. Like I was thinking, instead of saying war, I say words, you know, like I mix things that sound similar, get mixed up in my head and they're hard to separate. Yeah. Well, that's not just you. I have to do a lot of editing on this thing just to make myself <laughs> sound, you know, half normal. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We have that in common, Romy. So that's my... Uh, grandmother it grew up in Naples in Italy and that's how so when my grandfather joined uh, the you know joined the army and was in the second world war he after the war was over traveled back to meet this woman that he had met during the war and she was this was kind of scandalous she was 17 or 16 at the time and uh, he married her in Italy and then the next week they moved to the United States back to Philadelphia where my grandfather had a house and everybody was like, Oh my God, we're his, we're her, you know, family upset. And my mother was like, no, she was one of 12 kids. They were excited to get rid of one of them. <laughs> they were like, all right, we don't, that's a le one less mouth to feed. So <laughs> let's get as many of these kids out of here as we can. So uh, it's really funny is when I was 12, we went to uh, Europe for about three weeks. And we went and visited the church where my grandfather and grandmother were married. Um, we visited some family that's still there. My mom's in contact with a lot of them. And my mom speaks, as my mom says, she speaks Italian like a six-year-old because that's when she stopped speaking it. Because when she was raised, um, she was raised speaking Italian at home. And so she can speak it, but she understands it way better than she speaks because she doesn't speak it in hardly at all. She only contacts, you know, pe the, the people, the family in Italy, like, you know, maybe three or four times a year, but it's really funny to hear her speak it. She literally stops every couple seconds and thinks like she actually has to think about what she's saying. Yes. Languages are something um, really powerful, but at the same time, you know, I don't know, for example, I, I, I was raised speaking Spanish but my mom spoke Italian at home, but not to me, to my little brother. So I, I heard Italian my whole life, but I never spoke. And then I had to go to school to learn to, to um, speak and write Italian. And now I do it very well. But then um, I learned French later in life. And as soon as I started going to French school, I forgot Spanish and Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Like my brain could not handle like another language that was, uh, you know, like a Latin romantic oh, it has language. A, yeah, the same root. Yeah. Yeah. I, it was I, confusing. Can, can I, this is a, such an odd question, but I always think about this when people speak multiple languages, 
when you're dreaming at night, what language do you dream in? You know, I've been asked this question before, and I don't know. I haven't paid attention. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it depends on who I'm with in the dream. Like, uh, um, I remember dreams in, in English, but I also remember dreams um, in Spanish. And I think when I'm in Italy visiting family, I probably dream in Italian. I just don't know because it's so um, subconscious. So, Romina, tell us a little bit about your job. Now, you're a very famous, world-renowned stylist in the fashion world who works with uh, many famous people and models, and it's a very glamorous lifestyle that we would like to hear about. Well, um... (laughs) (laughs) And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not really. But go ahead. Um, well, so... Yes, I'm a fashion stylist, which means I create concepts uh, about how to dress people or I translate trends that are that you see on fashion shows into um, magazine photo shoots. I also dress actors. I I have a magazine with a friend and I propose a lot of the ideas like creative and art direction ideas so for example if i i really like a movie or i really like an actor or i really like a specific fashion designer i propose let's do something with that designer or or with that actor and then so it goes from art direction just on the pre-production just putting everything together and deciding the who, the how, the why, and then on the moment of the shoot, I have to pull clothes. So I basically call all the designers and I tell them, I'm working on this project and I borrow samples from you. And I collect, you know, in my apartment or in my office, tons of clothes that I bring on the photo shoot. And then I create like combinations, you know, like outfits and dress people. And it's so much fun. So who are some notable people you've worked with? Oh, wow. Um, In 2020, everything feels so blurry. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I work with Mila Kunis, the actress. Mm. And that was really fun. I like that lady. She's on, uh, she's the voice of, uh, what's her name, on Family Guy, too. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, Meg. Yeah pretty beautiful and kind of fun to work with. I work with Ethan Hawke uh, recently with Matt Dillon, like old school actors like that. That's awesome. With Also with some big models, like gorgeous girls that I dress for, not only for magazines, also for advertising campaigns or catalogs. So have you ever worked with someone really famous and they were just a total terror and made the whole thing very difficult? Um, yes. Would you like to name any of those people now on the podcast? Oh, my God. That's, <laughs> that's controversial. No, I actually don't do that because I don't want to uh, jeopardize. I don't want to jeopardize your career. I'm, I'm just having fun. Romy, do you want to commit career suicide right now? <laughs> exactly. I'm like, uh, this is not the best year to commit career suicide. <laughs> <laughs> Romy, I, I have a, a fashion question for you i buy my pants at costco what are your thoughts um no <laughs> <laughs> Romy, we, <laughs> no <laughs> we had a whole discussion tommy revealed in the last episode that he buys his clothing at costco not all of it but yeah i buy my pants there for sure why Dude. why <laughs> um i i think the biggest thing is is that uh so i buy uh whatever kind of khaki pants they have for work. So like I wear uh, khaki pants all the time because uh, when I, I I write at a whiteboard with a marker most of the day and I have an awful habit of wiping it on my pants. So I buy pants that are relatively inexpensive and easy to wash. So um, I used to wear really nice clothes when I worked at the law firm. And uh, when I got out of working there, I was like, I am only going to wear comfortable clothes when I'm at work. So I wear not loose fitting, but like, you know, straight leg khakis and, uh, 
in all different like I, I wear like the you know the brown like regular ones chino colored light gray dark gray uh, from costco from <laughs> yeah from costco they're all they're, they're literally made by and it's not like there's a couple times where i bought ones that are like you know tommy hilfiger or calvin klein or something like that but a lot of the times i buy them and they're the most comfortable ones and they're the ones that actually fit the best um they're actually made by costco the kirkland brand ones they're super good <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I um maybe this has to do with my upbringing. upbringing how do you say upbringing? <laughs> <laughs> upbringing. But uh, um, my mom and my dad were very bohemian, and I hated everything they they bought for me. So at a point when I was a teenager, I say, "Do ne- never buy me clothes. Like, just don't." And I started working at a fashion shop, like the coolest fashion shop in Caracas, if that it's a thing, you know. And I just started working really young so I could buy myself the clothes I liked. And clothing to me became my armor, you know, the way that I will portray myself in the world and feel good about myself, feel protected, feel like I was expressing my ideals and my personality and my beliefs through my outfits. And it's crazy because when I became a stylist, since I have to do that for other people, I became simpler in the way I dressed and I basically just wear black. And yeah. all, all my clothes look the same, but they're all different. And everything is extremely high quality. So I, I have one sweater, but it's, amazing cashmere sweater and I buy blouses that are made with real silk or really fine materials because I feel like I like the sensation of wearing something well made made from a noble fabric you know Romy I hear you on I that's the way well I can't afford a whole wardrobe of great stuff so I get one or two pieces I really like often picked out by you now, I had a decent, in my opinion, I had decent fashion sense before I met you. But, you know, being with a stylist, a real deal stylist, I can take it to the next level. Because I'll be like, I need a new jacket. And you'll send me like 15 options. And then I just have to pick. And you know the legit stuff, too. Like the real deal, high quality stuff. Yes, that's the thing. After being... So I started working in New York in 1997. So it's uh, 23 years of experience. Wow. And the truth is that I, when I lived in Caracas, I, I worked at the, these fashion boutiques that were for, for what Caracas is. They were like the best places to buy clothes. And I learned a lot there. You know, I learned a lot about styling and about, uh, quality of clothing and about dressing people even before I started working in the official fashion industry. And I also worked as a model because I had such a cool style and my friends were all artists, so they will use me as their muse. So I, um, I modeled a lot in Venezuela and I also, um, model for my friends, music videos, because all my friends were musicians and, so they will be like, oh, we're going to we're gonna film a video. Can you be the actress in the video? You know, things like that. And so I, I was exposed to all this even before I moved to New York. And I have to tell you, I moved to New York to be a model. Like I had an agent and that, that was my intention. But I met a stylist, an Italian stylist, and... She asked me if I wanted to work with her and I started working with her and I couldn't believe I was getting paid to basically do what I did for all my friends my whole life for fun. I, it was an actual job. I could, it was so shocking to me. You're going to pay me to play with clothing. (laughs) Are you kidding me? Like this is my dream job. And I think there is a, I don't know if it's a Tibetan, I hope I'm not mistaken, but there is the seven laws of success, you know, and one of the laws is the the law of the least effort. 
So basically, the things that you become successful at are the things that are not even an effort for you. You do them naturally because they're 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 part of who you are. Mm. And that's how I feel about styling. I can do it with my eyes closed. I can do it with a huge budget or with no money. I can dress somebody extremely famous or my friend, you know, it's it's a uh, yeah, even like with our friends, you can go in their closet and pick out stuff they already have and make them look better. Yes, yes. And <laughs> it's fun. Like, I honestly cannot believe this is a job. I, it's uh, it, it's a, kind of a, an amazing... It's like music for you guys, you know? You're like, oh, I'm making money by playing music with my friends. Yeah, well, we've never done that, but we hear that it's yeah. awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say it sounds amazing. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's the dream. It's the dream. But Romy, it sounds like you lead a pretty exotic and exciting lifestyle. How did you end up with me? Um. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to say how that happened without confessing. You know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So. We hunt, we we met through mutual friends, and <laughs> I, I you Tommy, you know how I always lament that like I go to all these shows up here and I never have anyone to go with. Oh yeah. So I I mentioned in passing that I'm going to this show, and she's like, "I'll go, I'll go with you. I I want to go." And I was like, "Cool, someone to go to the show with." And I was too dumb to realize that she liked me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like, "All right, I have someone to go to the show with," and then you know. After the first time we hung out, I was like, "Uh oh, this this feels like a date." I know it, <laughs> it's true. I at the beginning, I also thought it was just kind of a hanging out until like five minutes before we met the first time alone without friends. Yeah, and I panicked. I, I realized, "Oh my god, this is a date." What am I gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> it was really scary. I had not been with anybody in a very long time and i you know i have yeah it, it it i was just very scary all around yes it, it was scary and we we went to see that movie called first love <laughs> yes which was now, super intense yeah yeah you have to see that it's like a this action film extremely violent but also touching it's from the same guy who did ichi the killer Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've seen Ichi, but uh, no. Okay. What is it called? First Love? Yeah, yes. it's real good. It's yeah. an amazing movie, but it's very violent and gore. And Yeah. But it's very romantic, too. It's not too bad, though. Like I wouldn't watch Ichi the Killer, but this one this one was manageable. I'm bad with that, too. I actually do. You, I, I, Keith, I think I've told you this story before, but when we were uh, younger, I remember coming home from skateboarding one time, and a girl called me. Like later at night, and I'm talking like it was like 10 30, 11 o'clock at night. And I was like, Yeah, I just got home from skateboarding. She's like, Oh, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm watching skateboard movies at my house. Like, I, I, I literally just I filmed all day. So, like, we're, you know, I'm going over some of the tape and then I'm like, you know, just hanging out. She's like, Oh, okay, I'll come over. And she came over and I made her, I didn't even make her do it, but I, I sat down on my couch. I'm like, This is what I'm doing. So, if you're here, this is what we're doing. <laughs> I just I literally just watched an entire skateboard movie. And afterward, like, I remember I turned it off and I was like, all right, what do you want to do? And she's like, uh, are we going to make out or and I was like, oh, is that why you came over? Like, it was <laughs> I was so oblivious to that. Like, I didn't understand. I was like, I didn't understand. I, I, I didn't get it. I was like, why? And she's like, uh, I think you're really cute. I was like, oh, shit. I didn't I didn't pick <laughs> wow. up. on. I didn't pick up on that at all. That's you know, so funny. <laughs> yeah, no, that situation never, ever happened to me, especially when I was young, so I can't say that I relate or well, understand it's only, it. It's only happened to me once. Oh, well. Yeah, no, well, that's, a, that, that's only, that was a, it was a complete fluke. It's great, wow. Tommy. That's a really good story. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I relive it three, four times a year where I go, remember that time that girl came over? And I go, oh, yeah, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I have two brothers, and I'm the on, only girl. And because I grew up with them, I'm very comfortable around male humans oh, okay. because male I grew up humans. with two boys. So I, it's, I almost feel more comfortable around boys and girls because 
that's what I, you know, remember from my youth. And my brother will always help me out by teaching me, you know, if you ever date anyone, this is what you need to know, you know. <laughs> and basically he told me, we are stupid. Men are stupid. We don't understand anything. We don't know anything unless you tell us really clearly. For example, if you want something, don't don't hint. No, yeah. Tell us. Like, I want this. Like, if we were deficient, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. I yeah. would like you not to do that. I would like you to do that. I would like you to bring me here or I don't want to go there. Like, very clearly, because if you don't ex- express yourself clearly, no one is going to know. Like, male will will not understand what you're trying to say, you know? Well, Romy, we this past weekend we celebrated one year of relationship bliss together. <laughs> How does it feel? Um, it feels amazing. I so what you were tell, asking me, Tommy, earlier about quadriculado, which means graph paper. <laughs> um, that's my description of keys. Besides, I have other descriptions too. <laughs> <laughs> Like, we'll, we'll censor those out later. Yeah, sure. I was yeah, going to say. Like, sh- like, I call him Mr. Seltzer because he cannot live without having a seltzer bottle on his hand. Uh. Or I also call him Cable Guy because I never met anyone that has so many cables. Like, his whole apartment is like cable land. Like, probably we could make money <laughs> if we resell all those cables. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and there is others. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, which is crazy is that I think we both met at a vulnerable time in our lives where we had been burned, you know, and we decided to be alone. Yes. And nobody was looking for a relationship, neither probably ready for a relationship. Right. And I don't know, we just connected in this deep way and we decided to make it work. And luckily we're older now, so we're more mature. Yes. And so we're, you know, we're doing all the right things, I think, which are besides, you know, being into each other and, and loving, we try to listen to each other and to compromise without compromising yourself, you know? Yeah, we are, one of our struggles is we're we're the two most stubborn people on earth Yes. ever. So once we decide something, that's it. That's it. Uh, yeah. So, so sometimes it's like a standoff, but <laughs> s- with with some helpful advice from others, we just kind of found a way to make it work somehow. And it, I don't know, it, things things have been okay. Yeah. See, I like the way, like Romy put, it, is compromising without compromising yourself. Yes. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't mind doing things that my wife specifically. There, like, there's stuff that she sets up that I'm like, I know I'm gonna hate this. Like, right. But then I get there and I go, okay, this is enjoyable for her. She is having a great time. And because she's having a great time, like that energy rubs off on everybody around us. Like, so the girls are having a great time. I end up having a great time. It's very much a, that mindset you get into of like, okay, so this is give and take. This is going to be, you know, something I may not enjoy at first, but I've had way too many times where I've gone into something negative and been like, oh, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. And at the end of it, I'm like, I'm so glad I did this. Yeah, right. You have to do it and you have to have a good attitude and not ruin it for everybody else. Like that's that's the way it's got to go. And uh, Tommy, I've committed to going overseas with Romy. Can you believe that? That's how you know. This is for real. I, yeah, that's shocking. <laughs> can you, Romy, do me a favor? Take me, take a picture of his suitcase before he leaves. I know. <laughs> really, I want to see it because I imagine like it's like what you know, like those nineteen fifties videos where they're like packing your suitcase for leaving abroad, and then like they have like it, it's literally like every part is regimented. There's a comb on the top, like everything is. He's yes. pre- prepared yeah, for he's every walking. eventuality. <laughs> No, like, actually, I bring one pair of pants, exactly. two, two shirts, enough underwear and socks, and then like seven computers. But that's what <laughs> it's all planned, Tommy. You're right. He has a list in his mind. Clothing is not important, so I'm bringing three things. Yeah. And there is electronics and cables. <laughs> <laughs> we we went to... are coming. 
my wife got so mad at me when we went to so we weren't even we weren't even uh engaged we were just dating for a year her brother was an exchange student in brazil um and we went back to go visit his host family so we went to live with them for about two weeks and i remember i showed up at the airport and she started laughing at me and she's like where are your bags and i was like i have it <laughs> I, keep, I had a backpack and she was like you took a backpack you're gonna be gone for two weeks i was like well i got sneakers on and then there's a bunch of socks and underwear in there and like keith i think i packed five t-shirts and i figured i'm gonna be able to do laundry while i'm there like and then um i had a pair of jeans that i wore to the airport and i had a pair of uh like like regular shorts in From my bag. costco uh no, this was ten years. No, this was fifteen years ago. So there were probably like some goofy skateboard brand. Like there, you know. Um, we went to a duff- bunch of different shops. Um, we stayed in a place called Arastatuba. It's like uh about four four hours inland from Rio. And uh, when we stayed there, we stayed with this family, and they took us to a dress shop where they literally just had uh probably two to three hundred bolts of fabric on the wall and there was a person out front with a graph table and literally would, you know, sketch a dress and they would hand stitch it in front of you. And I think she ended up leaving with 15 dresses. That's amazing. (laughs) That's so fun. (laughs) She still had, she still has two of them and keep that at this point, you know, it is like probably 15 or 16 years ago we went and it was unbelievable to me because I was like, I'm, it was one of those situations again, I'm going to hate this. This is going to be me in a dress shop for eight hours. I sat there and watched this guy draw. It was unbelievable. That's fancy. You know, that's having your own personal tailor for, for a day. All together. She got 15 dresses. I think her total was just over $300. That's like, crazy. <laughs> it was on Unbel- because i remember looking at the bill going like what is this like what's the charge here and he's like oh that's for the seamstress seamstress and i was like it's a dollar 75 <laughs> like it's like it was like under like two dollars i was like how is that like that was an enormous amount of work and this woman has you know x number of years of experience running this machine it's like oh my gosh like this is just but the other thing was is uh they were excited. We tipped them in American money. So they were very uh, appreciative of that. That's, that's the sad thing. You know, I travel a lot for work and I go to these five-star hotels and I live kind of a, when I'm on a work trip, it's a very decadent life. You know, like I feel like a rock star. I'm in <laughs> these five-star hotels, eating and drinking whatever I want. And I have, you know, um, somebody that, you know, that comes to clean my room every day. And that somebody is a Spanish person generally, you know? Oh, yeah. And I always feel like, they, I, I wonder what they think. How is this Spanish bitch, you know? Why is she yeah. staying in this presidential suite at this hotel? Who is she, you know? Yes, the last thing I say that is maybe too dramatic for Quadriculado, um, there is a movie um, called Roma, um, I don't know if you guys seen it, but it's a Mexican movie and um and it's about that, Tommy, you have to watch it. It's about the di- the social difference and the work of the of the you know cleaning ladies basically, like domestic yeah. workers. And it's the, the director is Alfonso Cuaron, but it's an incredible, beautifully filmed, like it's like a piece of art and it's exactly about that. And I think it's worth, it's very worth seeing it to understand a little bit that reality, you know, and the humans behind it. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's scary because it really is like, that's the life yes. some people live and day in and day out. And then Keith, just to be fun again, um, you were asking me like about the, f- I don't know, like a famous or favorite actor I work with and, because I'm nervous because I'm speaking with you guys. I couldn't remember, but I just remember one. Is that actor Caleb Landry Jones? Um, he was on that uh, crazy movie, Get Out, the scary one. Yeah. Oh, and, that guy. Yeah. And the, also, the brother. 
Yes, and also on the three billboards outside Missouri, I think. Yes. And I even think he was on an X-Men movie, but he came to my apartment. We did the photo shoot here in my home. And really? I love So those pictures, those pictures I've seen of that guy, that's in your apartment. Yes, and I loved his movies and I think he's a great actor and having him here the whole day hanging out. Um, being photographed and styled by me and just spending the day with such a character and an interesting human being and actor, you know, like things like that happen in this career that you end up spending the day with people that, that, um, that you respect or admire or think are incredible. And that's what you're doing. You know, you're, you're just doing your job, but you happen to be doing it with people like that. And that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's really, really awesome. And Tommy, you have to see Romy's house sometime. It it looks like a movie set. You know when you someone has an apartment in New York City on TV and you see it and you're like, no one could no one has that. No one lives there. <laughs> like ex- exposed brick walls and uh it's that's just... her ap- that's her apartment. Oh my god. She has a fireplace in Manhattan. Holy and it yeah. works. I, I believe We had it lit yesterday. I believe that um, I can save money on everything, but not on my home. Like I need to, I need to be in an environment that, that I feel really comfortable and happy. And it's like part of the art of my life. Yes. It's waking up somewhere beautiful. Important question for Romy. Do you know anyone super famous who we can get on the show? Wow. That's, I mean, and just to talk in general about life and their career, or do they have to understand anything about post hardcore, <laughs> <laughs> well, emo, post punk? <laughs> uh, we we do primarily talk to musicians, so that that's a good starting point. I'm afraid to say names, and what about if then they say no, or they say yes, or I don't know. So there there is people that maybe we can talk talk about offline. Yes, yes, there is. There is for sure people. For example, like one time I was working with a beautiful model, which I won't say the name, and she brought her boyfriend to to the set and he was bored. So he hung out with me the whole day. And my assistants were like, like, you don't know who that is? And I'm like, no, it's the model's boyfriend. And it was Kanye West. And I... Well, don't particularly appreciate his music. So I didn't even know. I mean, I thought he's probably a musician, but whatever, you know, and I spent the whole day hanging out with him and it was so funny. And he was actually super nice and humble and down to earth and normal. He spent the whole day with us in the styling room, not on the front of the studio, like behind the scenes with us. And my assistants knew his music and loved him. So they convinced him to dance, do a little dance for their iPhone with them. And it w- he was that cool. Like he, I don't know. Like I, I feel like people arrive to fame and things change. But oh, I'm sure. before yeah. that, you know. He's been famous for a long time. Well, yeah. I don't know. He I was famous think- when I was in college because that's when I remember when college dropout came out. That was my junior or senior year. So 2003 or 2004. And it was that was huge. And that was his second album. So and see, and I never paid attention to him because I'm, I wasn't into, into the music. And that's the good thing about me um, when I work with people. I treat them like a subject that I'm working with. I never treat them like famous or important or rich. I just, okay, today we're working. Let's just be a team, you know? So I'm good at working with celebrities because I don't get affected by it, you know? like Yeah, and well, if, I ever, if I ever meet someone who's famous, I, I pretend that I don't care at all. It's like a power move. What yeah, do you think of that? Well... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I don't, I don't even pretend. It's just, it, I don't know. I, that day, my, my main focus is my job. Like I told you guys, I love doing it. So I don't even, um, but I have to tell you one time I styled, um, Daniel Radcliffe and I watch every single Harry Potter movie that there is because <laughs> I have a daughter, you know, I watched them with her and she was obsessed with him. 
And so that's the only time I went, I bought the book, the first Harry Potter book, and I brought it on set and I told him, listen, this is so not me. I know it sounds like a lie, but I never (laughs) done this. But can you please sign this book for my daughter, you know? And he did. And he was super sweet, you know? But I felt like, oh, my God, I'm so unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just have to, though, you know? I like mean, in a Harry Potter, like come on, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, Romy, this was a delight, and we thank you for coming on the show. Now, do you, th- you haven't listened to the podcast yet, but do you think you'll listen to your episode? Um, yes, I hope I don't, you know, die from shame. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's been great. So we thank you for coming on, and here's to many more years together. Yes, and Tommy, you, I love you without knowing you. I know that I know that you're an awesome guy, and I'm so happy you and Keith are doing this together and supporting each other creatively. You know. Yeah, I'm. I'm so glad that uh, honestly, like, you, look what you said. It's it's so nice to just know you by proxy. <laughs> like I don't. Yes. I don't like I don't, I, but I feel like I do know you really well. And I think yes. the other thing is, is that um, this is one of those things that when Keith said like, hey, let's start this. I was like, oh uh, yeah, okay. Like we'll see if this starts. And when it started, <laughs> I was like, wow, Keith is like. He's a powerhouse. Driven. <laughs> like you really want, like he He's is. Very like, driven. I'm telling you right now, guys, if I was running this podcast, it would be every month. Yeah. <laughs> like, for real. And once get- a month. And the guest would be like, all right, we got Bobby Meadows back again. Bobby's here. Uh, <laughs> he's sitting out by my shed. We're out here hang- hanging out. And uh, so we're just going to talk shit for like, you know what I mean? Like, it, but Keith keeps it like so professional and so, you know, so regimented, man. That's yeah. that's Keith always can is what he brings to the table is he is so consistent. He's so consistent. You are so consistent. And that makes me feel good because I know he loves me madly. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm course. like, okay, he loves me madly and he's not a, he doesn't waste time oh, and no, he no. wouldn't be invested on something that is not a productive investment, you know? Oh, no. No, <laughs> so, he would, Keith, <laughs> Keith would, if Keith thought there was anything in terms of like, if episode two of this, he was like, yeah, this doesn't work. He would have already started another podcast. Yes, same with the girlfriend. To... Same with the girlfriend. <laughs> it, it's it, it's that's one of the things that's admirable about Keith is like he's able to evaluate things very quickly and see is this worth my time and investment of energy and effort and all the things that I have to put into this. Like he does that so well, and it's it's really nice because he also this is something he really loves. I I mean yeah. I, I love doing it too, but like Keith this morning sent me he was like hey here's the post for tomorrow i already edited it and i was like i don't even think of stuff like that <laughs> like, i know it's, it's incredible i see him working he works so hard and cares so much about this and you know you know i like admirable. this uh, i like this portion of the show where you guys just keep saying nice things about me let's let's keep rolling with this <laughs> <laughs> but you know what tommy another thing so the quadriculado you know he i am the opposite I am abstract painting. There is no, the, the, the paper, the painting is bleeding on the paper, you know. So the combination of somebody so structured with me that I'm more of like a creative uh, thinker and very emotional and I'm very esoteric and I believe in like all the gods, you know, and and on astrology and I believe in past lives and, you know, and he's the opposite of all that. And I think the combination, <laughs> like literally, <laughs> the combination is amazing because um, we balance each other, you know, and and I love music. If I don't know anything about, uh, you know, the kind of music Keith loves, but when I go with him to hear it, I can appreciate the quality of the really good bands, you know, like yeah, that one band, of a- Holy Fun, you know, that- Oh, we- yeah. Dude. It's one of our first beautiful. dates was to uh, it was, uh, let's see it was saint vitus it was holy fawn psalm uh the end of the ocean and oh brother played and holy fawn was just unbelievable, unbelievable. i'm so glad i got i'm so glad i got to see them Romy really dug them and yeah the next day i was 
walking somewhere and I put Take Me With You on. And then I was like, oh, fuck. I think I like her. Oh, oh wow. man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what a cool feeling that is, though, when you recognize like you have a connection with someone and then that hope of like, oh, I hope they have the same. <laughs> yeah. One more thing I wanted to tell you. Um, I'm telling Tommy because Keith knows all my stories. But when, so just to reveal a little bit about myself, but I don't drink anymore, right? And one of the side effects of that is that I be, I developed this fear of flying and I have to fly everywhere, you know, and every month, you know. And so I was so afraid. Uh, but then when I met Keith and he gave me, um, a link to his record that he pu- he put out with his band, the last band that he was in. I will just play the, his music on the headphones and trust that because he was singing and we were in love, there was no way anything bad could happen. And he listening to his music like uh, saved me from complete despair on airplanes because I couldn't get drunk the whole flight, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> to, to not, to not realize what I was. I'm like, shit, I'm on the air, like in a metallic box and it doesn't feel natural and I'm going to die. That was my thought. <laughs> but instead I was listening to this music and trusting that life is, you know, you don't fall in love like that and then die on the first flight. That's just not going to happen. You know? No, it's and it, it that's a beautiful way to think of it. And it's nice that uh, especially music that, you know, Keith really when Keith makes something, you know that he spent his time doing it. Like there's oh, yeah. he, he, he doesn't rush through things. He doesn't. Nothing's haphazard. Everything's been planned. And if you <laughs> hear something that he's made, it's the 15th iteration of it. Like he's gone through it so many times with a fine tooth comb and gone, that part doesn't work. Let's move it. You might not like it, but you can't say it's not pro. I know how to make shit sound pro for sure. That band is beautiful. I love that record. And I almost wanted you to like do more with it, you know? Well, I I want to. You know, it's a beautiful record and it's carried me through really scary airplane situations (laughs) if i ever tommy and i were gonna continue that band with our drummer friend uh i want to do that i still want to do that it's just now is not the time you know i love it tommy you should because you know i i really heard it from like a clean perspective you know without knowing too much and it's beautiful music Keith did a really nice job. Keith, are you done being okay with it? <laughs> Have we said a nice uh, enough nice things yet? No? <laughs> yeah, now it's starting to get uncomfortable. I'm not used to this much praise. <laughs> well, Romy, thank you for being on the show, and uh, I'll talk to you later tonight. I can't wait to meet you in person. I know, me too. It, it's it's time. <laughs> yeah. Let's All do right. it. Okay, talk guys. Talk to you soon. Bye. All right, folks, now we're here with longtime friend and creator of Horror Prince, Chuck Moran. Hey, how's it going, guys? How's everybody doing today? Uh, I'm okay. It's uh, It was a busy work day, you know? I just did some stuff, played yeah. some video games, pretty typical <laughs> stuff. I'm getting like caught in that rhythm again where I don't know what day it is, what day of the week. Uh, I don't know how many times you guys have experienced that over the last like six months, but I'm in like the third cycle of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it happens multiple times every week. I always think I'm a day ahead and then I panic, but then I realize that what day it, like today I thought it was Thursday and I was like, oh man, I'm screwed. I have all this stuff to do. But then I was like, wait, it's Wednesday. We're good. Sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so Chuck, as an intro, tell the audience about who you are, and about Horror Prince. Well, my name is Charles Moran, and I am an illustrator, screen printer, sculptor, painter, uh, an artist, and uh, I have the brand Horror Prince, horrorprince.com, at Horror Prince as well, on the social media channels. And uh, I do all kinds of different events, and gig posters, and merch design, sculpture toys paintings things like that um for various promoters events entertainers and i've been doing it now for oh i guess over 10 years <laughs> yeah, it's been a long so time. uh but 
I've known both of you, I was thinking today, a very, very long time. Now that I think of it, I, I think Keith, I think we've known each other close to maybe 13 years and Tommy probably 20 at this point. Yeah. I met you my freshman year of college. Yes. Yeah. yeah my first exposure to Chuck, remember MySpace and the top eight or whatever that yeah, you can have yeah, on the yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always remember seeing this guy Chuck on your page and I was like, who is this dude? Why <laughs> don't I know him? What's his this, deal? This guy. This yeah. guy that Tommy knows. So Chuck, how did you, how did you, I'm always curious how people get artistic endeavors started. How did you start Horror Prince? What were the first projects that you did? Well, like anything, um, it takes a lot of time and patience and hard work. And it originally didn't just start as Horror Prince. It started as me doing concert posters and flyers and things like that. And then just very much being involved in um, the fan culture convention scene and going to repertory screenings of horror and sci-fi and cult movies. That's when I was kind of kind of got the itch to create my own spin on things. And uh, I guess it's been about probably, I would say about 10 years that I've been doing stuff under the Horror Prince brand and really getting it out there, working with other um, artists and uh, promoters and companies within the horror and convention scene and stuff like that. So it's been an interesting ride and it all just kind of builds upon itself. Nothing. Um, I mean, one of the things that I know you guys know and a lot of people out there know is following a passion and um, building upon that brick by brick and not taking anything for granted and working hard. And that's kind of where it all came from. And uh, I'm certainly fortunate to have worked with the people I've worked with and to have the opportunities I have had. So yeah. absolutely. And that's the thing I've realized doing this podcast is to create an artistic project and have it be something you really have to put in the work and there's a lot of work that goes into it. I mean, and it sounds like you've done that too. Yeah. And you know, a lot of that began back in the early two thousands when I met Tommy and I like there were things about his world that I had never experienced before, and I'd like to think vice versa. Oh, yeah. And um, that's one of the great things over the years when you meet people that you appreciate their passion for things and you appreciate their drive and their ethic and the things they accomplish. And um, you realize that that's how you have to do things and nothing comes easy in life, you know? <laughs> that's right. So what now I knew you originally mm -hmm. you did band posters for a number of awesome bands yes. gig posters i know you worked with r5 on a number of occasions yes of philly yes so what was the first band poster you got hired to do like real deal this is it they're they're paying me to draw this and make this i would say i had a pretty good thing going i mean r5 was good um in that um i would basically produce the artwork and Sean would okay it with the bands and everything. And I would basically kind of make prints and sell them at the shows. But it wasn't until after that that I started working with like Electric Factory where I was actually commissioned per poster where it was pretty good money working with bigger bands and stuff like that. But the first one I remember doing was I did Andrew WK, I think, for mm -hmm. R5, that he did a performance upstairs in the church where it was a spoken word, and then he did a piano um, concert. So that was cool. And he was a very, very nice guy to meet and uh, to be around. Yeah, very down-to-earth. I, I haven't met him personally, but he just seems like a very normal, down-to-earth person. Now, I, I went to a spoken word Andrew W.K. thing mm -hmm. at the church. I don't remember a piano concert. Now, that I would have liked to see, but the spoken word was very bizarre. I will have to see what I could dig up, but there may be video of it somewhere on one of my hard drives. I'll see what I could dig up. But um, yeah, he's he's wonderful. And it's the what they have been able to do as a company for the city over the years with the live events they've brought is, is just wonderful between him. And I, I know they did Henry Rollins. They did a similar thing with him and just so many other people over the years, too. Yeah, that spoken word. I remember 
I, there was people that just had seemed to have legitimate problems, <laughs> but they were asking Andrew WK how to solve them. Like yeah. people, people kept bringing up love and yes. how to navigate love, and Andrew was doing his best to answer it. And I was like, this is kind of bizarre. He's a very sincere, positive human. You know, you, and, you can uh, tell he genuinely cares. Yeah, about oh, about yeah. everyone yeah. he's talking to. Yeah, and Tommy, didn't he? Didn't the guys from Obituary back him on that first album that he yeah, did? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Or at least it was definitely the guy that plays with the Hawaiian, sh- the guitar player that wears the Hawaiian shirt is definitely the dude from Obituary. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure about I'm not sure if it's everybody, but it's de- that definitely the one guitar player for sure. So Chuck, in addition to working with a lot of awesome bands, I know you've worked with Mono, right? Yes. Maserati. Yes. Um, Cage. Cage, yes, Cage uh, Kennels from uh, Def Jux. Yeah. Uh, also, so in doing those posters for R5, I got to meet a lot of those bands, their management, and get jobs from that. So um, I was able to link up with RJD2 and do a tour poster for him in like 2010. Nice. And that was like, that was a big deal. And then I did a, like maybe four or five tour posters for Mono from Japan. And that was pretty cool because they they were all over the United States, so um, it definitely helped get my name out there. And Maserati has always been a great band, and those they were great guys to deal with. I actually I met those both of those bands on a double bill that they had done back in two thousand nine. It was my first screen printed poster I'd ever done. They played at the church, and then I think maybe a year later, within the next year, was when Jerry passed away. Yes, in that unfortunate incident. And uh, it's just sad, but they they just put out a new album that's excellent, Maserati. Highly suggest checking it out. Yeah, you know, I would love to get them on the show sometime. And I, I was at that show at the church that you mentioned, and I I passed a couple times on seeing them back back in that day, and I really wish I would not have. I will never forget that show for as long as I live because I did I I've never seen them live. I didn't know what to expect. I've never gone to see a band and just watch the drummer the entire time (laughs) i had my eyes on jerry the whole time that guy was just something else and that certainly was yeah and when that was just such a tragic accident which i think actually happened not far from where i live now and man it's just it's just so unfortunate it's just like one minute to the next you never know what can happen certainly certainly but you know like anything else, uh, they were able to move on and, you know, endure and persevere. And they just put out a new album, Enter the Mirror. So check it out, out there. All of their stuff is, is just excellent. Now, in addition to working with an, a number of awesome mm-hmm. bands, you also work with some comedian. Well, at least one comedian, too, right? Yeah. You did a... So um, I guess it was like around that time, it would have been like, 2011 or 2012, I started uh, working with Pat Oswalt doing posters for him. And I've been doing posters for him ever since. But I've worked with some other comedians too. But it's uh, it's unique to work with him because whenever I do, it's somewhere throughout the country or world. Um, so it's another case of being able to proliferate my art to a different market that I would normally get to. So uh, it's always great. But he's a great guy, very nice guy to deal with, uh, very funny. <laughs> do you deal with him directly or do you go yes. through management? Oh, no, really? I, I deal directly with Patton. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. He's a very, like, he's a very humble, open guy. Again, like, you know, like I have to believe in the universe that if you, have, if you have a, a, like a humble and contrary heart, um, it's going to work out. You're going to find those other people, you know? Right. Yeah, I guess the only time I guess you'd get an attitude is if you worked with Eddie Murphy in his prime or something, right? That would have like, been cool. Yeah. Just to just to be around Charlie Murphy that time. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want Eddie Murphy. Just I want to hang out with Charlie Murphy. Watch him get in fights with Rick, Rick James. <laughs> I heard a story Charlie Murphy told a story on the Stern show that back in the day Charlie would be in the crowd when Eddie was on and if people weren't laughing, Charlie would would beat up the audience for Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. I never heard that one. Now that is support. Like oh none my other. God. <laughs> He's like Keith, you could definitely appreciate it because you've done stand up before. Um like 
the temerity that it takes to do that, to be able to speak in front of people. And Charlie Murphy didn't even start stand up himself until he became big on the Chappelle show. Right. So that's like, yeah. that's amazing. And then at that point he was doing like a national comedy central tour. So you can imagine the pressure on him. Like of all the things I've done in my life, stand up comedy was by far the hardest. Yeah. It, it didn't help that I was never prepared uh, and usually drunk or high <laughs> or both. I went to that. I, I went was, to that first tour, that uh, Charlie Murphy tour. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the Keswick Theater, it was it was <sighs> the called the I'm Rich Biatch tour, <laughs> and, and it was him and Christian Finnegan opened. Yeah. Uh, the dude from Larry. Yeah, uh, uh, Donnell Rawlings. Yeah, Donnell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Keith. I always think about with when you did stand up comedy. I'm always like. What a nerve wracking, panicky thing because it's immediate feedback. Oh, it's like, bad. I I never I enjoyed like, it. I never enjoyed it. Like and I, I have to I, temper all those egos too. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and the, I did not find the comedy community very supportive. And <laughs> and um, well, I wasn't very funny either, so that didn't help. So it's it's like if if you're funny, you know you'll you'll get in like sure. people will put you on shows and stuff but if you're not you won't and it it doesn't you have to really love it to do that and i you think do. to be i think to be successful in comedy you have to kind of be a loser like you have to have nothing else going on <laughs> at all you know yeah you have to be part, fully devoted for sure um, yeah it's interesting though um in the past 2 years i've actually gone to a few comedy open mics with my nephew who's 21 and uh, kind of taking him out there to like open mics in Berks County. So uh, it's like, like at bowling alleys. So it's real interesting. Oh, the, I'm the, sure. vari the variety that you see. Um, but I, I have so much respect for people that can do stand up and not just do stand up, but do like road comedy. I, yeah. have, I have two friends that are road comics, J.T. Haverstadt out of Austin, Texas, and Jay Shinoin out of – Jay lives in Massachusetts, I believe. And mm -hmm. these guys, up until everything happened with COVID, were doing one to two tours a year where they would tour throughout the country. And, you know, when they tour throughout the country, they get spots touring or opening for bigger people at times. But they're basically doing what a small DIY band would do. And touring that way and there are i can't imagine there are many comedians that are able to do that without some type of major backing the way bands can or maybe did do it 15 years ago you know yeah and the cool thing about it is you have this routine in your head you can just you can just show up at a place and say it and mm -hmm. make money i mean that's cool sure sure but it's like anything i mean you have to weather the the good days with the bad days and um, just, it's, it's, it's remarkable to me because I see things from a lot of different angles. Um, now that I've been doing things as long as I have about, I'd say eight or nine years ago, I started doing horror conventions and different conventions with my artwork. Um, I, I did a, a couple down in Texas called Flatstock, which were strictly for concert poster artists, but it's interesting to see the hustle of everybody and, you know, the good days and the bad days and how people deal with it and, you know, how you know you have to have a thick skin to follow your passion in life, you know? Oh, yeah. Big you time. Know, whatever it is. I mean, Tommy, you know, too, with the education that you've been through. Oh, It's yeah. anything, man. Like, yeah. anything worthwhile shouldn't be easy. It, <laughs> right. It, and in the, midst, in the midst of it, it sucks. Like, yeah, there's so many sure. times. It, and the thing that separates people that are – good at something or some people that are mediocre at something from the people that are great and and continue to get great is is just perseverance it's just sure. not you just can't give up like i you see have to you have to love it too like comedy oh, yeah. i always hated i never enjoyed it it was always nerve-wracking mm -hmm. it, it was just not something i ever looked forward to but i felt like i had to try it or do it for some reason mm -hmm. this podcast i love doing this so if someone told me that I couldn't do it or that I was bad at it, I would just be like, fuck you. I don't yeah. give a shit what you think. <laughs> yeah. And I would keep doing it because I love it and I, I think it's Absolutely. great. Absolutely. And I yeah. think everybody has to have that, whether you're playing music, writing right. comedy, acting. I think you need that passion. 
the, you know, to get through things. Um, Cause there are going to be dark days and there are going to be bad days, but you have to remember that you have a limited time and finite energy, you know? So you do a lot of these uh, horror conventions. Give us some saucy stories. Do you ever see any uh, weird stuff go down with the horror movie actors? Or like I see, some... I see, I've seen lots of things go down. I, yeah, I always <laughs> think about like, Chuck's Instagram for horror prints is hilarious. Yeah, because some of the people that do like, especially the co- like, if you've never been to a horror convention, people do a lot of cosplay, so they dress up like yes. the yeah. people in horror movies. Some of the actual like costumes are unbelievable. People oh spend goodness. people spend literally hundreds of hours designing, making, and and like and perfecting the makeup. It, it's unbelievable, like what people do. And then there's also just crazy people. Yeah, there's, yeah. like there's just li- like that's it's, it's a scene, man. It's that's a scene. some stories, Chuck. <laughs> some stories. Well. um, it, I'll, I'll tell you this one. This is a pretty good one. Uh, it must have been maybe six years ago, six or seven years ago. We did this convention out in the Midwest. And I, when I say we, I mean there was me and like a group of fellow artist vendors that usually do shows in Jersey in the tri-state area. And we were going to go out to the Midwest, out to Chicago and do this convention. And uh, we got out there, me and my friend Chris Garofalo, great artist, if you don't know him, check him out, QFS Chris, uh, had tables right next to each other. And it turned out we were like right in this area where uh, quite a few celebrities would be. So it turned out Tara Reed from, uh, what the heck movie was she in? The Pie Sharknado. Fucker. Sharknado. Yeah, Sharknado and the Pie Fucker movie. <laughs> her, her table, sorry. <laughs> you can curse. Oh, okay. Uh, her table was right across from ours and just seeing like, um, the flow of things and the, the little idiosyncrasies of her personality, I guess, throughout the weekend was interesting without getting into anything too bad. But I think that her and Corey Feldman might've been up to some shenanigans. Yes. Evil shenanigans. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I mean, whatever. Uh, they're grown adults. They're probably not married at the time. And if they are, you know, good luck with well, that. Probably yeah. an open relationship or something, wow. <laughs> but it's always fun at those things. Um, they like now that they're not around anymore. Well, at least temporarily, it's like you could really appreciate the good times that you've had. And a lot of the time it's not, I mean, it's great that you see actors that were in movies and things like that, but it's a lot about the relationships and friends that you make there, meeting other artists and things like that, um, that you really look back on in a positive way, as much as if you were like in a band that toured and you, you were like, damn it, I don't get to see that person because they live in Texas, you know? Right. So uh, those are the things I like to think on more fondly. <laughs> now, you created my new favorite shirt. It's the, it's the uh, Sonic Youth album cover, but... <laughs> turned, it, turned into the blues brothers yes. yes yes and i designed that i think i when the heck was it that the cubs won the series what year was 2008. that was that 2008 no i don't think that long ago no whatever You're year asking it was, the wrong person whatever year it was that's when i did that but uh i just felt like it was such a good parallel and uh i know the john belushi estate saw it and like retweeted it whenever I first released it, which is really cool. Oh, oh wow. wow. That's um, awesome. So uh, hopefully one day I'll get to show Dan Aykroyd that. Oh, man, that would that would be amazing. To yeah. be able to talk to him and talk about those old days with John and everything, oh, that would goodness. be like, we got to get him on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, man, you <laughs> yeah. just have to find like some UFO slant. That's that what I was going like, to say. Uh, just, like, oh, is he a big be... like? Oh, yes, Tommy. Oh, I don't goodness. know anything. I had no idea. I oh, had no we, idea. We time. just need to tell him the show is about ghost hunting, and he'd be right on. Just oh, like, he's one of those guys too. Holy yeah, cow! Yeah, yeah. You should do like a Byberry episode. I love those. <laughs> yeah, there's no but the Byberry's gone. 
We actually oh, yeah. did. We did do a Byberry episode. Yeah, we did a whole. Yeah, yeah, we talked about that. I know you did That's with, Meadow, was, with oh, Meadows I was, for a while. I was, I was referencing that because oh. Keith didn't want them to talk about it anymore because <laughs> it dragged on. <laughs> I forget that people actually listen to this show sometimes. I do. I do. I do. I'm a fan. So, so are are you now? You're a fan, but are you a member? A member. Are you a member of the Northeast scene? I don't believe so. Does that oh. mean that I subscribe to the iPod thing? Yeah. No, all you have to do is say that you are, and you are. I am a member of the Northeast scene. Yes, <laughs> that's our that's our third official member. Now, Vadim said he was a member. Mike Mig said he was a member. Okay. Shout out to Mike. <laughs> okay. And, and now you, Chuck. Great. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. How does I'm, it feel? Good. It's good to be a part of something and not have to, like... Um, feel like I got jumped in or something like that or had to do anything crazy like me and Tommy would have had to do at one point in college. Oh, but we're... that's a story for another time and not to be broadcast <laughs> everywhere. Well, that's a, I was going to say that's how I, fe- I met Chuck because Chuck was the <laughs> what, Chuck, what floor were you? Seven? I was uh, the fifth. Yeah, the fifth floor. He was the RA. fifth floor. Uh, he was the RA. Like Chuck, Wait, was, Chuck was the RA. Dude, Chuck was in charge yeah. of shit. Chuck was that in charge. Wrong. Not only yeah. was Chuck, not only was Chuck an <laughs> RA on the floor. Chuck, you were the head of the RAs, right? I wasn't. I was a senior RA. Yeah. I don't think I was a head, and it was my second year as an RA, so they pushed me to do that. And then, very scandalously, months later, I was fired. <laughs> Why? I was there. I was fired. I was there that day. <laughs> Why? Um, well, well. You can't abandon your post if you're on duty, Keith. And that oh. is what I did. <laughs> and I, it was the shame of my family. I ruined the, the <laughs> reputation. I dragged our name through the mud. My poor mother cried for weeks. Oh, and it was all because they Chuck was supposed to be in his <laughs> dorm, right? And then yeah. some asshole pulled the fire alarm and they were like, where's the RA? <laughs> Yeah, and I, was, and I was down the block at my girlfriend's house. Yeah. <laughs> Something like, like that. And it was like, it was the the funniest thing because I remember the like they made you move out. Remember? Well, they they did. They well, they made me give up my room, and then I was like, I had nowhere to go, so I had to live on was it the second floor, and that's when I met you because you <laughs> lived on the other side of the floor. The, they and, kicked you out with the rejects. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And thank God I had a friend, Dan, who was like, you could come live with me. So I lived on the same floor. Me and Tommy became friends. It would have been uh, 2001. And then within the next two years, I think we got a radio show either together or separately. I think oh, at yeah. one point separately. Hold on. on. You guys had a radio show? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. WRKC. So, Tommy, you have experience in this? Oh, no, not really. No. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> don't tell it, Tommy. No, I'm not going to say. So okay, I so we, we had we had a fun time there, and what that eventually did, where I was going with bringing that up, uh, was that we eventually started going to more shows in Wilkes-Barre, yeah. yes. and because at the time a life once lost was touring Fourth Plague Flies, so yeah. Doug and Tommy were still and and Bob, excuse me, were talking. Um, so whenever they come to town, we would definitely go to home base to see that was home base to see them or cafe Metro. It was to but see a them. couple different places. Yeah. Well, I've seen both. them at home base and yeah. it, I've seen it at both places, but yeah, but, um, both those places are no longer there. Home base is now rubble. It was in the Murray complex in Wilkes-Barre, almost downtown. That's now rubble, but that is a legendary club in Northeast Pennsylvania. Yes. Um, all the heavy hitters played there. Bob Mack used to run that place. Yeah. Yeah, Bobby, oh, Mac. Bobby Mac. You know he DJed one of my parties when I was doing that. I oh, did. Ruba? He did Ruba. <laughs> yeah, uh, f- Tritone. That's great. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to. I want to hear more about this radio station. <laughs> oh, no. I know where Tommy wants to take it, but I'm not going to let him. Yeah. Um, right. it, because here's there's better stories to be had. So we went <laughs> yes. to we went to a Catholic college, King's College in Northeast Pennsylvania, Wilkes-Barre. And they had this uh, radio as part of the college, WRKC 88.5, that was run by this priest, Father Father Tom Carton. Now, Father Tom basically uh, ran this station with a broadcaster in Northeast PA by the name of Sue 
I, I, I well, forget the Sue's program last manager. Name. I forget her name, but she's, she's successful. She's gone on to work in radio up there. But so we had, uh, basically two roomfuls full of CDs that were sent by every small indie label in the country or around the world. And no one ever played the shit that we listened to. Like no one ever played like thrash metal or doom metal or death metal. So there were piles of great shit from like Nuclear Blast and all these other awesome labels. Literally, Century, we, Century Media would send a package, uh, it, it like every month or every yes. every other month, and it was I'm um, Keith. I'm not exaggerating. It was it was thirty pounds, and it was just CDs, stickers, yep. shirts. But um, it was a great experience. Um, they've since like completely redone that studio and have completely new updated equipment. But they had some old ass equipment there. Oh, man. Yeah. And it was really funny. It was like they would always do like the ratings every month. And yes. the ratings were horrific. Like they were so yes. bad. But the thing that did the, <laughs> the, the best every single day, like it was one of the longest running radio shows in it, it was the it was the longest running radio yes. show for a long time in northeastern Pennsylvania. Yes. And it, it's called Radio Home Visitor. That's it. The Radio Home Visitor. So what this gentleman used to do, this father, Tom Carton, is he would sit there and he would read the entire newspaper, the entire like citizen's voice or something the, every, every day. Hey, Keith. Not like a little bit of the newspaper, not like the front page, not like section B2. He would read the whole thing, the obituaries, the fucking garage sale announcements, like everything in the newspaper. Yes. And the whole idea was for it was started as a program for the visually impaired. So like people that were blind that couldn't get the newspaper in Braille, what they would do is they would broadcast the entire newspaper. But it, it was like a four and a half hour long show. Yeah, yeah. that sounds soothing. Uh, he had a nice voice. Father it's Tom like would, an early podcast. Yeah, Father he, Tom. Yeah, he, he did, used to yell at us though for for playing music. He did not like if he caught like my show or Tommy's show on, and we were playing like death metal. He would come scream at us. Oh, he was. So wait, were yet. you just supposed to talk or something? No, we were supposed to play music, but he didn't like the music choices we made. <laughs> so he see. would he would just say, and it was funny because like our show. Why didn't you play Zayo or something? We did. We, did. we, we played all kinds of it. Yeah. Uh, he didn't like it? I played, dude, I played the whole, uh, I remember it's, somebody called in one time because they were like, what are you guys even playing right now? So I was like, oh, okay, we'll put something else on. I made, I played the whole uh, Isis Red Sea yes. uh, EP. Yeah. Like I played, played the whole thing all the way through. And, and they called back and they're like, yeah, man, that's more like it. Exactly. And I'm like. You really? <laughs> what? <laughs> like I wow. we were, yeah. Oh, like, yeah, play God. the heavy stuff. I'm like, what He's do you got good taste? He did have yeah. good taste. And it was a, it was such a strange experience. The other oh. thing was is that like my show was on from ten at night to one in the morning on uh Friday nights. Yeah. And it was like the you would think that's the shift everybody wants, like because that's when people are like putting the radio on at parties and stuff like that. But like it wasn't nobody would play the radio at parties. It was fucking it was, mix CDs, like it was burned CDs. So like right. you were literally you were talking to nobody. It was it was really fun. It was a strange experience though, because it was a strange experience. But like the best part was because it was like a small liberal arts college. They would let anybody have a, a – basically anybody have a radio station. You had to screw up pretty bad to get kicked off too. But we knew guys that got kicked off. Our buddies Justin and Chuck basically got a radio show and they would go there once a week for three hours and just get – intoxicated like really and they bad. would and they would pretend they were howard stern yeah <laughs> and it eventually did not work because that priest found out <laughs> yeah well the other thing was is like there's there's no there was a button on the pa on the controls like that was a dump button where you could literally press it and it would stop so it yes. was on like a three second delay right here's the only problem like when they're all tanked up and not paying attention like they're just letting things fly so like yeah. it, it's an it's a becomes like a real serious thing because if somebody picks it up like we could be literally fined like the school can get fined by the fcc so we're like like i remember a couple times where i, I was playing things and it's like most of the time with metal you can't understand the lyrics enough to like be able to like oh you're gonna get in trouble for this but like I remember listening to things like I'd like heavier hardcore stuff and they would have a breakdown and it'd be like, fuck it up. And I'm like, Oh no, that went over the air. 
Like, uh, oh, it wasn't it's here. all right. No one was listening to you anyway. I know. You like, it. So I, I was that. That was the thing. Nobody was listening to anybody, and I, I have always had an instigator tilt to me. Yes. I've always tried to like pry, just like poke, just a little too much. Tommy could tell you that about me, but, uh, but so I made a, a flyer for my show and this almost got kicked me kicked off the air because I put it all over the campus and it, it was, it said, um, Fridays, I think it was like four to seven was my time. And my name was DJ splinter mouth and my show is called sold as is. And it said, the flyer said, get on your feet. And then underneath it, it had a picture of a baby with no arms and no legs, like physically disformed. And I put it everywhere, all over campus. They had to have a station meeting about it and call me out anonymously and scold me. Yeah. Well, it's pretty cool. I have gotten cease and desist letters before from other people. I got one like two or three years ago from Guns N' Roses. From what? There. What happened? Uh, I did a parody on Appetite for Destruction. But mm-hmm. it was uh, the gang from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And it said Patty's Pub and it said Appetite for Dissension under it. And I was selling it. And like within a month, I got a cease and desist letter from, I guess, their licensing brand or whatever. Yeah. 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 With, <laughs> with, with, with what you do, you know, you kind of mix different media and do your own spin sure. on it. Sure. But I imagine with artists who do that type of thing, they get a lot of cease and desist because you're, you know, you're, you're doing like a mix, like a mashup of different things. It's, it's really like, it's 50, 50, man, because I know guys and gals, excuse me, uh, that make their living just doing all bootleg stuff, you know? Yeah. And that, that isn't licensed. And guess that's what? A lot that's how of the life makes his living. Well, a lot. Of, really? <laughs> that was really? Like the whole thing was like, that's why what people wanted to beat him up. He was like selling oh, all God. like bootleg shit. Yeah, oh, I bought man. a bootleg Texas is the Reason VHS from him like 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> that was his whole thing was like half his table was like unlicensed shit that he had just printed. Yeah, but a lot a lot of the time like that that kind of stuff can open doors. Like I've already had gigs open up because I created something and then the creator saw it and was like, "Let's let's produce more of these or let's do a t-shirt of this," you know. Yeah. Um so that's always cool. I my thing is this, if you're an illustrator and you're doing a small edition of things. It's just like a print edition. But if you're doing like 500 posters, that's different, man. Like that, you are, it, first of all, you're going to have, chances are you're going to have a tough time selling that many. Secondly, um, it's just like, it, it's better. It, I've always thought it's better to try to approach things of an artistic mindset rather than a business mindset. Uh, yes. Uh, but not everyone agrees with that. I, I understand that. Not all artists agree with that. And not everybody can afford to do that either. Well, Chuck, I also want to talk about one of your greatest achievements oh boy. was creating some of the artwork for the Northeast scene. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Creating the logo, <laughs> the branding, if you will, for the Northeast yes. scene. Yes. Y- yes. Now, uh, I... I I mostly create everything myself because mm-hmm. I just don't like to rely on other people yes. and they often disappoint me. I'm yeah. sure you I'm sure you've experienced this as well. Sure. Sure. But when we were getting ready to launch this thing, I was like, We need logos and Tommy's like, I'll ask Chuck and I was like, Yes. yes. Chuck Chuck is cool. He'll yes. he won't disappoint. No, thank you. Thank and you. Chuck and did, I was gonna say Chuck did it overnight. Yeah. yeah. Like was, I asked him Friday night, he had it Saturday afternoon. Like one one thing, like getting back to what you said about, you know, relying, you know, be reliability, relying on people. Um, it The great thing in life is as you get older, you know who you can rely on. Um, yes. And that's just the fact of life. But, you know, just if you were a musician, you would want to know how to engineer your, your music properly. You know, if you're an artist, you're eventually going to want to know how to print your stuff correctly. If you're a sculptor, you're going to eventually want to know how to make replications of your sculpture and sell them you know because if you could cut out that middle man you increase your profit margins so right and a, a lot of my disappointment and hesitation in asking help from other people comes from bands like in my last band i was always asking for help like can someone create a picture for this can sure. someone help do this and i just wouldn't get any response at all mm-hmm. so everything <laughs> everything i've done i had to learn how to do myself and yes. that's i'm glad i'm so glad 
that we can do this thing, this podcast, yeah. with just us. We don't have to rely on anybody else. I, I pretty much do everything myself, and mm -hmm. I have some help with sound engineering, and you've helped out with uh, some of our branding. And mm -hmm. together as a unit, we do this thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's important. No, it, it's it's difficult to do things yourself. There's only so much you can do yourself, but it's great whenever you can find someone to rely on. I've been very fortunate over the years to have many good friends that I can rely on. I love them all, you guys included. Oh, well, thanks, Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah. Well, listen, man, we want to thank you so much for coming on the show. This was sure. awesome. And thanks for having me. Everyone check out Chuck online, Horror Prince. That's yes. P-R-I-N-T-S, not yes. Horror Prince, yeah. like the Prince of Horror. <laughs> or like Prince, <laughs> or like a purple rain type thing where like yeah, purple, yeah. purple pain horror prints p-r-i-n-t-s dot com and horror prints on instagram check them out and uh that's it so listen yes sir listen to us everybody <laughs> listen yes, to us subscribe to us follow us rate us review us become a member like chuck did today all you got to do is say i'm a member and boom you're in you're one in. of us, one of us. Google, <laughs> Google gobble, gobble, Google Google gobble. gobble. <laughs> is, is that a uh, Wilkes Barre lacrosse thing? No, oh. it's a reference to the movie Freaks. Yeah, that's from oh. like that, yeah, that old, old, old one. And it was like one of the... No, like it, that Freak book, the Freak book. It's uh, that curb, the Freak book? No. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, is, is Freaks the movie with Alex Winter? No. No, this uh, is like, I think it's from like 1930. 37 30, but the whole thing that the big controversy with it was is that they used really disabled people from like a, a sideshow yeah oh, no. so there was like zippy the pinhead and uh you know uh Same. half a man uh the tattooed man uh the bearded lady like they used like real people that were actual sideshow performers so it kind of got a little same little. director as dracula there you go bram stoker yeah, and that's the. It's all about the. <laughs> it, the, the movie has to do. There's a the the scene he's referencing is like there's a um uh, read the scariest part of the movie for me when I saw it was like uh the the guy who's a half a man he's just like the the torso person like so he literally from the waist down is nothing. Uh, they're gonna go after this girl. They're gonna make her a freak because she's beautiful. So that she's gonna be one of us. So they're like mm -hmm. chanting one of us as they're all approaching her, and then they cut to a shot of the. They're all out in this, like they all live in trail, like you know those trailers, like RVs kind of thing. Yeah. This like half a man has a knife between his teeth, and he is like pulling himself across the mud to go get this woman. It's very, uh, it's an unnerving shot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I won't be watching that, but I take your word for it that it's good. Hey, Keith. Yes. I have a question for you. Oh yes. Do you, Do you have any uh, design to uh, play live? Are you Are you doing that? I want to. I want mm -hmm. to. I would like to continue my band that I put out in 2018. And I was I was starting to jam with some friends before the whole pandemic struck. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we might still do that. I, I think that uh, you need to make that happen. Yeah. And I, I really would, want and to. I, I'm, I'm, I will put you on the spot right now and say it. I would love to do a poster for whenever you do play live. Oh go. fuck yeah, dude! If I'm if I'm in another band and we're doing a show, hopefully one day uh, you're you're in you're you're right there. You need to do it with the basement here. Yeah. I well, Tommy, we got to start that band. I, I here's my thing. I, I I have a guitar. I have an amp. Apparently, we can record all of our stuff on a computer. I say, as soon as we can, kind of get our shit together. And how much how apropos would it be to write a follow up with Tommy? basically in the basement over the next year. Oh, we're, shit. We're going to be locked up for the next year, boys. Yeah. You just blew my mind. It's a legitimate wow. basement year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, you've given me a lot to think about for sure. All right, Chuck. Thank you for being here, and thanks, everybody, for listening, and until next time.